better on my pronunciations. <laughs> uh, We're live. Well, welcome everyone. Hello. Konnichiwa. Anyo aseo. Bienvenidos. A very, very good Sunday to those of you here today, live in our Zoom studio for, and also on Facebook for Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. I'm Sandy Uno, and I'm the author of Boats for Women from Salmon Poetry. And I am so truly, deeply honored to be hosting today's special event, Witness, a conversation in poetry. And I wanna emphasize that conversation in poetry because we will be hearing um, poetry and conversation with three generations of Asian, Asian American women poets featuring today, Janice Miri Tikani, Mary Oishi, and Tanya Kohong Koheyonne. Today's reading was really inspired by Tanya's appearance with us on World Poetry Day in March, um, as well as um, a reading that I was able to hear between Janice and Mary, which Mary hosted. I'm genuinely grateful to these three women for their time, their energy, um, really their passion for coming together to meet, imagine, and plan this program where they will share their poetry, stories, histories, wisdom, and insights today from within the container of Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month. But I really offer you a very humble reminder that we should see and hear the experiences of peoples at all times and recognize the diversity that resides in each of us. Well, before I introduce the guest poets today, let me just share a very little bit about Cultivating Voices Live Poetry itself. Cultivating Voices Live Poetry held our first reading on March 29th, 2020, in response to the shutdowns of in-person venues everywhere, and has developed into an international intersectional intergenerational um, and today we're really going to be featuring the intergenerational um, weekly reading series and poetry community and we have now over 2600 members worldwide. We alternate weekly readings between our popular new book showcase our poets focus readings with themes with a live open mic and our occasional special event like today's reading. Well, our format today is a little um, different than our, our usual format because it's this conversation in poetry. Um, you will hear the poets read in three rounds, three to four rounds with conversation and questions in between. If you have a question that you'd like us to lift um, into the conversation, um, feel free to put your question in um, send your question to me in Zoom um, via personal message so that I see it. And if you're watching live on Facebook, feel free to post your question and um, Kim Ports Parsons will help us monitor. We may not get to all the questions, but we'll do our best to integrate and bring what we can into the conversation today. Well, now it is my uh, distinct pleasure to introduce um, today's poets. And in our first round, they will each read two poems each. Um, I will give you all, I will, um, we're gonna begin today with Janice Mary Kitani, who is San Francisco's second poet laureate. She was poet laureate from 2000 to 2002. And she has authored five books of poetry, including her most recent, Out of the Dust, from University of Hawaii Press 2015. She is the editor of nine landmark anthologies, which provide platforms for writers of color, women, youth, and children. She co-authored a biography, Beyond the Possible, with Harper One Publishers 
with her husband, the Reverend Cecil Williams. With her parents, Mir Kitani was incarcerated as an, in an Arkansas concentration camp with the mass internment of Japanese Americans during World War II. Mary Kitani and the Reverend Cecil Williams are the co-founders of the Glide Church Foundation, which for the past 50 years plus has achieved worldwide recognition as a groundbreaking organization, empowering San Francisco's poor and marginalized communities. It is really my just distinct uh, honor and privilege to welcome you here um, to our program today, Janice. Thank you. So looking forward to hearing your work again, but now in person, virtually. <laughs> Thank you, Roger. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction. Um, yes, I was in a camp with my parents and I was uh, an infant when we entered, uh, when we were you know, first detained. Um, so I don't have very many memories of the camp, but I certainly remember the years after we were released. Uh, so I'm gonna start with a poem in a voice spoken for a five-year-old child. After we were released from the World War II concentration camps in 1945 and relocated to what I call the diaspora of Japanese Americans, my parents and I um, relocated to Chicago where we felt uh, would not be as prejudiced against us than on the West Coast. But we, even as children in every city, did not escape the racism that had poisoned America after World War II. This is called Kamikaze on a Clothesline. Chicago is the coldest place on earth in January. You are five years old, a big girl. You know to knock on Mr. Utsui's door when you come home from school. Your mother asked him to keep you while she works long hours after your father left you. Mr. Utsui lives in a small apartment on the third floor down the hall from you and your mother. Mr. Utsui does not talk much, but he keeps you safe from bullies who call you Jap and slant eyes. One time you and your friend Isawa were dragged down from the third floor by a big 10 year old white guy down the stairs. Black kids in the neighborhood didn't pick on you but fought with white kids a lot. One day you come home from school and it is snowing very hard. Mr. Isui isn't home and you wait in the hallway for a long time. You look for him in the backyard and they are fighting. You are scared, but can't move, frozen by the violence between the white and the black kids, throwing fistfuls of rock-packed snowballs that sprayed their bodies. The whites are winning and chase the blacks out of the yard. And suddenly the white bully sees you and yells to his gang, a Jap, let's hang the Jap. See if she can fly like a kamikaze. You try to run, but they catch you, pull off your coat, tie your sweater sleeves around you, and hang you from the clothesline, dangling like a strung up chicken. The boys rush to each side of the clothesline and reel you back and forth, making airplane, airplane noises in their throats. Kamikaze, kamikaze, oh, oh, oh. oh. You so crazy, I so slanty, you can't see. So you crash and die, <sighs> kamikaze. You slide back and forth on the line, screaming and crying as the white boys laugh. You think you will die, shivering from the cold, from the cold and your face is numb, tears turning to ice. Then you hear a loud, Oy! get away. The boys see Mr. Utsui, swinging a samurai sword around his head as they scatter through the snow. He unties you from the clothesline and carries you to his warm room where you were and serves you hot soup and apologizes for not being home. 
he was kept waiting at the doctor's office. Later, you ask your mother why the white boys call you kamikaze and try to kill you. And she tells you, Mr. Isui lost his son fighting in the US Army while he and his wife were locked up in a prison camp in Arkansas. You were in the same camp. And when Mr. Isui got the letter that his son had died, he took his treasured samurai sword and ran to the barbed wire fence as if to cut it to pieces. She said she thought for sure the camp guards would shoot him, but they didn't. They just laughed and laughed and called him crazy, like the kamikaze crashing their planes on suicide missions. But he isn't the kamikaze, you say? No, not the enemy, she says. Black children, white children in a snowstorm, shooting each other with snowballs. American Japanese in prison camps, not the enemy. You are not the enemy. Thank you. This poem is entitled A Woman with Straight Back. It is for my mother, who after 40 years of silence testified before the Commission on Wartime Relocation of Japanese American Citizens. Her testimony, along with hundreds of others, resulted in the signing of the redress bill in August of 1988. I am the stone, my mother says, smooth, oval. My memory is a chisel from which I shape my mouth. The stone hangs down her neck, tied by the thinnest chain, invisible around her throat. She wore it close to her skin, like normal garment. The weight of it caused her to straighten her back, chin high, rising against it. To understand, you must contemplate pride, she said, not the insolence of vanity or conceit. It is called face, controlled emotion, self-consequence, quiet dignity. Dolomite, greenstone, granite. She pulls against the growing weight, stone on stone, like each moment dropped into the mute well of memory. She worked building the farm, precious well water, pregnant with her first child, plowing, planting the seeds. Sudden invasions by government men who slit the sacks of grain to pour like gold into their bins. They let the apples rot, gravel the soiled seed for heavy trucks and machinery. Guilty by reason of race and nationality, the military accused and sent us to horse stalls steaming with manure where we were detained and then board us, boarded us onto trains with shade drawn windows, taking only what we, she could carry, an infant at her breast and bundles strapped to her back. My mother bore the endless dark ride to Arkansas swamps and one room barracks. There were open toilets for women who hid their shame, covered their heads with paper sacks. I delivered mail in camp, she tells. The letters weighed like slab stone to an old couple whose five sons enlisted in the US Army to prove that they were loyal Americans. All five were killed in combat. The mail, heavier than weapons. Carefully, she chisels a woman's mouth into the stone she lifts from her neck. Obsidian, serpentine, bloodstone. Today, the redress bill is signed. Her body is lighter than water. With a chisel of her tongue, 
She shapes the curve of her words to understand, contemplate pride, she says. Yes, I will take the reparations. It's not the amount. No monetary measure can price injustice and loss and humiliation. The years of face silent as stone. But if you'll make them think twice before they do it again to anyone else, I'll stay alive to exact an apology as physical as a gash across their national budget. Memory is a chiseled shape of a woman with straight back, holding a rock the size of an apology. She will stand chin high at the doorway of history and know we none will go into those camps again. Thank you, Janice. Uh, but before I uh, have Mary read her opening two poems, I just wanted to um, bring um, into kind of consciousness that, you know, that phrase that you use that frozen by violence. And my, all of this comes from like just my own kind of attempt at humanity and my own deep curiosity. I'm, I'm curious about at, 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 at which, at, at when did you know that you would be able to use your voice to lift, um, to lift the stories and the history that was frozen by violence. Um, also, from your from your mother's perspective, you know, at what at, at what point did you recognize that you would be that you would that you would carry the stories and kind of continue that legacy of continuing to make sure that, um, you know, that silence would not prevail. Well, I think that we are frozen by violence in many, many ways. And I think that shame is perhaps the greatest silencer because, you know, it's the embarrassment, it is really the loss of face, uh, being in prison for expediency, the most unjust kind of mass incarceration for absolutely no reason. There were no causes of, there were no, uh, there was no proof of any kind of treason that was committed by any of the Japanese Americans and none by the, the new immigrants. And of course, 50% of the, of the people incarcerated in these camps were children. And I was one of them. Um, and I think through our, through our lives, I mean, through my life, and I'm the oldest person here. <laughs> so I've had a lot of experience with violence, including, you know, personal, as well as relationship, and seeing the violence that has been perpetrated against Asian Americans with the recent, recent historical hate crimes against us, as well as from slavery to prison camps for African American communities, and also the tension and the harassment of uh, Latinx people, Mexican people, Mexican Americans, uh, and of course the most horrific crimes against the Native Americans. I think we have all been silenced by the violence, not just because, you know, I mean, I think we carry our stories and we feel obligated and we feel compelled to tell our stories, but I believe that we've been frozen in silence by the establishment, by the institution of publishing, by the media, by you know, history books, by the public school system, by every institution that has a responsibility to educate the people, the American people, and I mean all of us, all of the diversity of us. But all of our diverse histories have been omitted. And I, that's what I believe is a really violent act. And it's an act that continues against us. And it continues the stereotypes that continue to kill us. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's. Do I sound a little mad? No, no, <laughs> I no, little... no. I mean, I, I mean, <laughs> uh, you know, as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a person, you know, my, I, you know, I have my own intersectional connections with, 
violence. I, I remember LGBTQ community and, and of course, way back um, as an Italian American, you know, oh, yeah. uh, yep, you know, there, you know, all, every, you know, and every generation, every culture, um, it goes all the way back, as you said, right to the beginning of what we call American history. You go right to Native American and the the colonization and the genocide right there. Um, yes. and, uh, and, you know, how do we not learn from, how do we not learn from that history? Well, it's because we, uh, you know, each generation, we has not been told the his the true histories, the true histories. Um, and, uh, and, and, and I, uh, yeah, I appreciate that connection between shame and violence because there is an interconnectedness that does create that frozen that silence yeah. and and then the the breaking of that silence so very critical you. this is why i want to interject this sandra that your program is so important because what you're doing is you're bringing the different diverse voices together and being and hearing each other as well as telling the country and telling other people uh, who are ignorant or don't know or haven't been taught that here we are here's our culture here's our history here's who we are so thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I'm going to uh, now introduce Mary Oishi, who will add to the conversation this, this layering, really, today, this layering. Um, and um, we will hear more from Janice shortly. Well, Mary Oishi joins us today. as Albuquerque's Poet Laureate and the author of the book, Spirit Birds They Told Me. She's also the co-author of Rock, Paper and Scissors, which was a New Mexico, Arizona Book Award finalist. She's been a contributor to numerous print and digital publications, including in translation. She is a lifelong peace and social justice activist championing women's rights, gay rights, and anti-racism. She was a delegate to the United Nations World Conference Against Racism, and she is also a 26-year public radio personality in her home area of the beautiful Southwest of the United States. Thank you, Mary, for being with us today. Thank you for having me and thank you for uh, agreeing to put this together or having the inspiration to put this together. Um, and we appreciate it very much. I have to say before I read that uh, Janice was such a wonderful uh, inspiration to me. Uh, in my 30s, I got a rejection letter from a poetry magazine and the gentleman who sent the letter not only rejected my work, which is fine. I mean, that happens, right? But he also told me I'm not a poet. <laughs> so um, I was prepared to put all of my poems in a drawer and be Emily Dickinson 2.0. <laughs> and uh, hope that people discovered them after my death and um, perhaps found some use in them. But my friend gave me a book by Janice called uh, Break, Shedding Silence. And I read that book and I said, oh my God, I am too a poet. I'm just a Japanese American poet. <laughs> and so I persisted after that. And here I am, the person who's not a poet, and I'm the poet laureate of Albuquerque. So thank you, Janice. <laughs> you were quite the inspiration to me. Um, so I'm going to highlight a different part of the Asian American experience. Uh, too many times we're thought of as a monolith, you know, uh, uh, so much so that 
people will confuse Japan and China, you know, sometimes even in poetry, but in conversation uh, where they will talk about uh, Mount Fuji and the cherry blossom festivals and then say that they're in Shanghai, which, <laughs> or Beijing, which um, we would never do that. We are not allowed to be that ignorant of Europe. We would never say we're uh, we're at uh, you know we we see the the Eiffel Tower and we're we just visited the Louvre and now we're going to go have escargot and crepe, <laughs> but we're in Berlin or London. We would never do that. But this is what happens. Um, one of the many microaggressions that we as Asian Americans endure sometimes, but. Um, Many Asian Americans came here to, for a better life. A lot of second sons in Japan were encouraged to come here in the early 1900s to find some, you know, some opportunity. And many still come from Asia for opportunity. Uh, so it's intentional immigration. However, some come, many come, especially in, uh, the 70s, many came from Vietnam and Laos and Cambodia. And my mother was someone who came as a refugee from war. So I think that that's another experience that Asian Americans have. So when you say Asian American, it's it's a bit like saying Christian. You know, there's not, um, you can say Christian and there's everything from Amish people who don't drive cars or have electricity to monks, to people who go to church on Christmas and Easter. And there's, you know, so anyway, I won't go on, but I'm just saying <laughs> we're not a monolith. This is called Tokyo Untold and it is from Spirit Birds, they told me. You never said they use napalm. You never told me that mom. The day I found out in an email was the same day I came down with the worst flu I had in 30 years. My coworkers said I looked ashen. I know I didn't quite make it to the commode. I was retching, retching. God, was I sick. They use napalm. You never told me that, Mom. Aunt Haruna told me, me and your mother, we were watching our neighbor boy. He went crazy with all the bombing. He kept going out and waving at the airplanes. Me and your mother, we were watching, laughing at him. He was so crazy. Then somebody leaned out of one of the airplanes and took his head right off with a machine gun, ta -ta 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 -ta, just like that. Then she laughed that laugh that used to enrage the soldiers in Vietnam. You know that laugh, mom, like it's all too horrible. Like you either run out and wave at airplanes or your two sisters howling from across the street. You never said they use napalm. There's a lot you never told me, mom. What you did say stays with me fresher than September 11th. Though I thought of it again that morning, when I saw the people running terrified, their faces full of ash. What would they do if it was all of Manhattan, I thought. If the planes kept coming, then they'd know what my mother knew. The morning shocking news sinks down in the guts by afternoon. And for me, every afternoon is still the afternoon of that day you told the story. I'll never forget it if I live to be a hundred. We just had quite the day in Japantown, you telling the shopkeepers, Domo Arangato, I used to buy lots of tapes with just one music, you said. But then he tell me, why you not get this one? It have 20 music, more cheaper, most cheapest one. So now I buy this one tape, get 20 music. We go have sushi lunch down by the moat, I watch you stack your tiles, amazed that such a tiny woman can eat so much. It was delicious. It was a good day, mom, remember? On the Bay Bridge, I asked that fateful question, the one my brothers never asked. What was it like, mom? The war, what was it like? Oh, the brains just keep coming all night long, never stop. I was running through the streets, everywhere, buildings on fire, whole city burning. 
I was jumping over dead bodies as I run. Girls my age, old people, little children. I not know why I was running anywhere I run to just as dangerous as where I run from. I just run in sheer terror. Nobody could clean anything up and the stench. Oh, it was the worst smell I ever smelled. Worst smell you could imagine. I just keep running and telling myself, I've got to live. I told your sons the night before you died, but I didn't say anything about napalm. I didn't know they used napalm. You never told me that, mom. I guess you couldn't remember or maybe you never knew. It took so long to tell me anything at all. I uh, didn't grow up with my mother. That's why I say uh, my brothers, my brothers did. And so I was shocked that they didn't, they had never heard the story, but they never asked. So this is another poem about being a refugee from war. My mother, the refugee, she didn't come over immediately after the war. She married my father who was a soldier. He fought in the Philippines and then re-enlisted and, and ended up in the occupation forces. My mother, the refugee, but you know how it is when you have a car accident, you don't wanna go down that street for a long time. You know, I think it's the same thing. My mother just needed to get away from the scene of such horror. My mother, the refugee, she came here to escape the scene where fire rained, rivers boiled. She found herself in the burning glare of cashiers, other shoppers at Moose's five and 10. With its uneven wooden floors, nickel ice cream cones, white supremacy not for sale at any price, white hot hate dished out for free whenever she showed up. She could never go home, dishonoring her family by marrying an honor guard, chauffeur for the occupying general's wife, had to live every day with his 11 by 14 glossy on proud display, signed to Sergeant Jimmy, General Douglas MacArthur. Nobody knew or cared that Kabuki theater having a slow season could fill the house with the legend of her ancestor. Here they remembered Pearl Harbor, that's all they needed to know. She was unwelcome, unwanted. Though she studied, became a citizen, this was never her home. Her ashes still move in Pacific waters that may in centuries carry her back. Meanwhile, back and forth, back and forth, not quite here, not quite there, always a refugee. Thank you, Mary. I'm, um, you know, my question for my question for you at this moment is I'm, I'm, you know, I'm thinking about what you talked about in terms of your mother's escaping the scene and the necessity to escape the scene. And I'm reminded of, again, let's go back to what Janice was talking about, you know, the, the trauma and that that the first generation of folks that experience the trauma are not usually, are not often the ones that can tell the story. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you see this in many, in, in, many, in many historical narratives of different kinds, um, whether that is ones perpetuated by violence um, as, as, as certainly, as certainly these narratives are, um, uh, or disaster narratives as well, are, are other ones that I see this that I see this happen. And um, what I'm curious about is, you know, as a poet, what it, what it, what has it felt like to carry that responsibility to tell to tell the story? Um, because you, I know that you have a range of things that you write about, but it seems like a big responsibility. And I would just, I'd just like to hear you talk a little bit about 
that in your own work, if you wouldn't mind. Well, the fact that I was taken from my mother when I was a, an infant and then again as, as a toddler um, and I was cut off from my heritage, I think in a way created more of an appreciation for what she went through than had I grown up with her. I think that, you know, just in the, in the, in the same way that my brothers didn't ask her about the war um, and they grew up with her. So it wasn't as important to them, I guess. They were, you know, just trying to survive in Oakland, California. You know? <laughs> and I was, you know, across the continent with, you know, fundamentalist Christian, uh, you know, a, a woman I called mom whose parents met at a KKK rally, literally. And so um, for a long time, I was just trying to reconnect with my heritage because, you know, I was also grew up in a sundown town. So black people weren't allowed to spend the night. They were very racist. That was a town where it had mooses five and 10, where my mother was just glared at until she left the store. And, and so I understand why she wanted to get away from there, but, you know, I ended up growing up there. So I think that you know, for the longest time, I didn't even feel like I was Japanese, you know, because I didn't, I never saw any Asians. <laughs> I saw Mennonites and Holy Rollers from Appalachia, that was it. And so, you know, I, I think I felt like it was a privilege. It was a chance to reconnect with my heritage, to get mm -hmm. to know my mother and to be able to, to, understand her story and understand, I mean, part of understanding why she gave me away, I helped to understand, it helped me to understand um, her story and, and the tragedy of her life. And also um, just identify with the refugees of war, you know, no matter which, which war. And I um, think it made me into a really strong peace activist because of what she endured. And I mean, I was microscopic, you know, <laughs> uh, I was an egg in that womb of that 17 year old girl running through that terror. So, you know, I think that it, it's some, um, like a, a, a genetic level, I understand, you know, the terror of war. And so, um, so I, am, I am proud to be able to bring that forward. I, I feel like, you know, it's an honor for me to, it's an honor of my mother and of all people who survive war to be able to bring that forward and make it present and alive. So as we too easily say, oh, let's, you know, let's have strong national defense and let's go bomb these people and bomb those people. And it's like, no, <laughs> you know, um, yeah. So I guess that's what I say. <laughs> you know, I think that's, uh, I think that's so interesting um, as, a, as a person who, you know, I do believe that our womb experience does imprint on us very deeply. And uh, so I'm really um, struck by you bringing that literally to the forefront. Um, because I, I do have to believe that, yes, that, um, that you were imprinted early, early, early on um, to, to carry forward this, to carry forward the stories because of that. So it makes, it, it makes a lot of sense from what I understand about the experience of being in the mother's womb. And um, yeah. Well, I'm going to shift over now to Tanya. Thank you, Mary. Um, because we're talking about from one war to another war that, that, that Tanya's book, The War Still Within, addresses. And so let me share with you a little bit about our next reader. Tanya Kohong. Kohei Yone is the author of five books 
The War Still Within, Poems of the Korean Diaspora, Mother to Myself, a collection of poems in Korean from 2015, Yellow Flowers on a Rainy Day from 2003, Mother's Diary of Generation from 2002, and Generation 1.5 from 1993. Tanya's poetry has appeared in Rattle, and if you want to see an, a, a really terrific interview, uh, she recently was on Rattle with Tim, the Rattle cast with Tim Green. Uh, her poetry has appeared in Rattle, the Beloit Poetry Journal, Cultural Weekly, the Feminist Press, Lunch Ticket, Great Weather for Media, Korean, Korea Times, Korea Central Day News, among many others. Tanya's work has won the Yun Dunju Korean American Literature Award and was the finalist in the Frontiers Chapbook Contest and has been nominated for a Pushcart Prize. In 2015 and 2018, she became the first person to translate and publish Arthur Z's poems in Korean. Tanya's poetry also in her book, The War Still Within, Poems of the Korean Diaspora, includes a segmented poem, Comfort Women, which received an honorable mention from the Women's National Book Association. It is dedicated to, quote, all the women everywhere who have lost their names. It also celebrates the courage of women to speak their truth and acknowledges the suffering of those who never could. The book just last month was awarded as only the 10th recipient of the prestigious Ko Won Literary Award. Would you please welcome Tanya Kohan. Thank you so much, Sandy. And um, I'm just like I feel like overwhelmed, like I didn't mean to have this moment, but um, through Genesis and Mary's poem, and I should have gone first. <laughs> I didn't really expect this. Um, I think Janice's experience and Mary's experience are different than mine. And as a Korean, immigrant myself, I cannot call Janice and Mary because they're older than me. So I supposed to call them Sambeni or Anni, big sister. And then we got so strong tight through this um, event we prepare. We met separately and then we got such a strong connection to each other and then we call it ourselves sisters. So I am not gonna call Mary or Janice. I'm gonna call them Anni, big sister. And I think we have like a different experience because Janice is like a third generation, Samse, and then Mary is Ise, and I'm the first generation. And then they both, um, you know, they with the Japanese, but, and then I'm Korean. So um, actually I had to learn English when I came to America and I came here when I was 18 years old. And so I think to honor my language, I'm gonna start with Korean first, not letting you know what I am reading. So I'm gonna start with the short poems with that. 둘째 시간, 어두운 방으로 불러갔다. 창이 없는, 미세스 로페츠가 그림책을 보여주었다. 강, 내가 말한다. 틀렸어. River, 라고 그녀가 말한다. River, 내가 말한다. River가 아니라니까. River, 그녀가 말한다. 그렇게 말했어요. River, 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 river. 강, 강이에요. 그녀가 고개를 흔든다. 내 입을 봐. 레, 브, river, river. 그로 나는 입을 다물었다. Second period. I am called to little dark room. 
winter lists. Mrs. Lopez show me a picture book. Come, I say. No, river, she says. River, I say. Not river, it's a river, she says. That's what I said. River, river, river. Come, it's a come. She shook her head. Look at my mouth, she says. River, river, I say. Then shut my mouth. You know, I still have a hard time to say R <laughs> and then L. And um, so whenever I have a hard time, and then I'm just going to go ahead and read this poem. And then here we go. Or you got to learn, you got to change it like your tunes to listen to immigrants, um, you know, the accents. And actually, um, I heard how many languages are speaking in um in America, I think like there's so many, I, I used to know the language, but at least like 45%, more than 45% of American, even more, I gotta go back there, but they don't speak English in their home. Do you know that? So like, and then so many languages. And um, just knowing, I think only 0.7% of uh, books are translated in English in America because now that everywhere they write in, in um, different languages, uh, English first, so they don't translate in English because they already written in um, English. But um, so the translation is just so hard. And then I think it's in a way because if you don't have a translation, then you lose of the origins and losing of the history because what is it? So then uh, for myself, I think I have to translate myself. And first I written in Korean, but then um, later I had to translate myself, but I don't know if it's to translate or what, but like, I mean, at least I have to express myself. Otherwise, it's gonna be so different and then it's gonna be loose, it's gonna be die, and then it's, it's gonna be uh, washed through the history. It's not gonna be remembered. So I think it's my duty, my responsibility to share my poem through um, both languages. So um, as I say, I came to United States and um, I think I wanted to share with you this show poem, Generation 1.5. Lack, lack, lack. Identity, citizenship, language. An awkward life, two people living in one body. 1.5. Opta, opta, opta. 확실한 신원도. 정확한 국적도, 편한 언어도, 언제나 한몸 속에 너무나 틀린 두 사람이 사는 것 같은 불편 속에 산다. So when I start learning English and living in United States, and I went to school, and then I'm learn about the culture, and then different mindset, um, and then way of different culture, how we connect with other people. That is just totally different. Even the writing, the language, just let's say the um, paper, just let's say paper. I had a so hard time to writing a paper because it even um, just even, I don't know if you maybe received my email and then why she was saying always say hello, you know, na, 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 not just like going down to the, you know, facts. So we learn in Korea, the way of learning essay, you have to say introduction first. What's the introduction is not you're talking about that you're focusing on the what you're gonna win paper. About the round spiral, that's how we learn. Spiral way of the talking. And then you're not really directly talking about what you're gonna say. If you say exactly, I'm gonna talk about what's gonna be Sunday events today, 
Number one, if you just like a cha 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 cha, then that's not gonna be a good paper. You have to say it's raining outside. The smells of a coffee wakes me this morning. That's how you start it. And then the end, maybe you say something like you don't even say I love you. You know, um, something different, very metaphors way. And that's how I learned. And then here you are, your paper, they're saying, you don't say the point here. And you're just get kind of get lost. Uh, for, for saying that, I think Mary was in one of the, my reading and then she said, Tanya, the gap poem is so important to share. And then so, that's what I'm gonna share. It's very short poem, but that poem is actually my first poem that I wrote in English. And then uh, while I was writing Generation 1.5, that was the bilingual. And then when I was writing, I said, hmm, wow, it just like kind of become triangle in the English. So let me translate in Korean in triangle. But when I translate it, it just became upside down. So exactly I understood myself, the previous poem that I wrote to you on awkward life, two people living in one body. That's how I feel. And especially when I'm writing right now in Korean, I just think like I just have to forget it about English mind, English mindset. And then I have to write in Korean and then also when I write in English, I have to forget about um, Korean. But somehow it just like, I'm just like interesting to see how I see my uh, language process, the way I write. Like that was the before, but like now I'm trying to merge it. And um, that was just like interesting, but this is like a beginning of the poem. So I thought like it would be very interesting to show to you. So I'm gonna hold it and I know it's gonna be upside down, but I'm gonna just hold it and then I'm gonna read it to you. The gap, gap between Hyone and Tanya, gap between Seoul and Los Angeles, gap between rice and bread, gap between kimchi and salad, gap between my natural skin and my cover skin, Get between my mother tongue, my second language. Get between my inherited blood, my transfused blood. Get the gap between me and my other self. And Korean goes, Hyone wa Tanya, ku saiye gap. Seoul ga Los Angeles, ku saiye gap. Pap ga pang, ku saiye gap. Kimchi wa salad, ku saiye gap. Ne sal ga dopuchin kossa, ku saiye gap. 모국어와 제2국어 그 사이에 갭 타고난 피와 수혈된 피그 사이에 갭 나와 또 다른 하나의 나그 사이에 갭 갭. And um, it is still so true that I feel gap. Even like my name, I uh, had a Tanya, you know, and then my last name could change code to Kohong and you know, I wanted to get like my Korean name, Hyun Hae. The reason I got the, um, the American name is that um, people cannot pronounce my name. And um, that was the happening. And so I think I just wanted to share one more poem. I was like kind of hard, but like since like we're talking about the language, I'm gonna close with this part of the poem, mother tongue. Sophistication is damn good to drink. So why don't you untie my tongue? Like you under the, undress me in the dark. Don't let my ego ruin our night. Don't scan betrayal in your mind. Life is not so bad if you don't pay attention. Reaching out in the night, I don't know what I am trying to grasp. When the sound of a trumpet wraps my body, I want to speak in my mother tongue. I 
I don't apologize. Sorry, sorry. English is my first language. Yes, I smell like a garlic. Don't kiss me. I had a kimchi. You smell too, like a scorched lamb and Limburger. Let's just love each other. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. You know, what I, what I always appreciate about you every time you're with us is you just bring your whole self. Oh. Yes, thank you. Thank you. I, um, I'm going to actually ask all of you this question before we move to a next round of poems. Um, which is, I'm really mindful not to homogenize mm. such diverse cultures and histories um, and nevertheless being mindful of that. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering what shared perspectives and visions have, you, have each of you heard in each other's poetry in that first round? that may or may not be obvious to those of us listening to you, and particularly some of us may be hearing you for the first time. And if you'd like, I'm happy to put that in the chat as well for you. Mm. I feel like, you know, the instant Spontaneous connection between Mary and Tanya and myself ha has to do with us, number one, coming from an Asian American background and or nationalities as diverse as they are, but also that common thread of being marginalized in a way in which Asian American women particularly have been marginalized, um, hypersexualized, uh, made fun of in terms of accent, language, um, appearance, um, that there are some, some common ways in which I think all of us have experienced the um, uglier side of America in that we have been put into boxes which totally limit our humanity. And I think the responsibility, as you asked before, Sandra, uh, of a writer, of a poet, of anybody who's you know, speaking out um, is to tell people who we are and to tell the truth of who we are, uh, but mainly to tell the truth because uh, there are so many lies that are out there about all of us. And I think as Asian American women, that there is a particular way in which we have uh, internalized self-hate or, you know, I don't speak for you and for Tanya and Mary, but I certainly speak for myself, but there's a way in which we, uh, that I have been, you know, I've internalized uh, the kind of rejection and self-hatred that I've seen so many, like uh, members of my family because of the camp experience um, face. And I, I, I think we do carry very common, strong bonds. I, um... Want to first of all, I agree with everything that you said, Janice, and and I also want to salute our little sister Tanya. I um, appreciated the beauty of what everything she said, and it helps me to understand hearing someone who came in her lifetime what my mother experienced being a first generation immigrant and the language barriers. I, I shared this with Tanya and Janice when we had our preliminary discussion that my mother could never hear the difference between Tuesday and Thursday, mm -hmm. which, you know, when my brother would say he had football practice on Thursday, she'd say, is that the Thursday after Wednesday or before Wednesday? You know, so, so she couldn't hear that difference. And I mean, I understand that because when she would say certain Japanese words, 
I couldn't hear the difference. You know, when I said, oh, does our name mean delicious? And she said, no, our name means a big rock, like the rock of Gibraltar. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, okay, so what is, what is the word for delicious then? And she would say it and it sounded the same to me. <laughs> you know, so I get it. I understand that sometimes you can't hear the difference in another language. And so, so even though, you know, whether we recently came or we're the child of someone who came in their lifetime or whether we're third generation like Janice, it doesn't matter. We're always otherized. <laughs> we're always the foreigner. You know, we get this, you know, where are you from? San Francisco, but where are you from? <laughs> you know, it's like they don't accept uh, that we can be Americans even if we're third generation Americans. Um, you know, we're never fully part of it. And I think that's how we can develop, we can get a, a quick rapport and, and um, support each other because we have that, that experience in common no matter what our diversity of experience or backgrounds. Tanya, you care to add anything? I was talking and then I unmute myself. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, it was just like amazing to meet um, Janice and Mary and hear their poetry. Um, I, the Mary sent me the um, conversation, they um, had it together and then YouTube sent it to me. And then it was just like, um, ah, I mean, I hope like, you know, you go check it out, the Mary, and then Genesis, like the YouTube, and then hear their conversation. I couldn't sleep. And um, if I just didn't hear Genesis conversation, if I didn't read her poetry, I would say third generation, speaking mm. perfect English, no accent. Look at her, she has no pain. She would not know any pain. But then hear about, in, about her mom cannot have the dental um, tooth and all that kind of story. And then I said, oh my goodness, it just opens my heart. And then able to see the truth and then courage to speak the truth. That was just amazing. Also Mary's poem and I don't know exactly, didn't know the details, but she's expressed talking about that she was taken away from her mom and then later she united. And then I said, but didn't you not like your mom was not American because she has accent because she, was, she came from um, Japanese. And then she said, no, I love to spend time with my mom wanted to know more about the culture. That was just like amazing experience. And then they ever to press and then put in contrast in that word in the poem is amazing. And for myself, I am the one who's experiencing all this immigrant life. And I think I could have just ignored and then I say it, like I could say like, Hey, I don't know about things. I don't want to talk about it. You know why? It's because to talk about pain, talk about truth, is very shameful. Because mm -hmm. I want, and then to talk about it, and then I have three children, I don't want them to know that I had a pain. I don't want them to know that like, that experience, maybe they feel like, oh, I don't want my mother had that experience. But if I don't share it, then they will never know. And then it's just still going on, it's suppressed. And one of the, my poems say, the nice girl don't speak, but I wanted to speak my mind. So also at this moment, I wanted to really thank you, my sisters, Mary and Janice. Well, I was very touched by your story. Um, Tanya also, and of course, Mary. Um, 
But the issue around language and the issue around uh, existing almost in two different beings. Um, but because my grandmother, who is really the one who saved my life from, you know, abusive childhood, um, she couldn't speak English, but mm. she understood she understood my pain. And even though she, you know, I, I didn't know what she was saying in Japanese so much of the time, I understood that she was with me and that she loved me unconditionally. There's a soul touch, I think, a soul connection that we have regardless of what that language is. So when you're talking about in Korean, you're saying that river um, and and our the you know I mean people always ask me where did I learn to speak English so well <laughs> so I, I get that you know because they expect me to say rats of ruck you know rats of ruck or you know some kind of crazy um cra you know just crazy distortion of 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 vowels and consonants and, yes um, yeah but when I read your poetry, Tanya, about the comfort women, I was so incredibly touched. And it, because, you know, I met some of the comfort women mm. uh, uh, while they were, you know, struggling to have their story told. Um, and I've written poems about them. But it just, I think that connection of being enslaved by violence, by war, by powerlessness, by being, you know, put into a less than underclass category, has is very common to us because we're it's taken for granted that mm -hmm. we're underclass and that we will be silent. And what you say about the shame, and you don't want your children to know that you had pain. Well, yeah, that's what my mother said. I don't want to talk about it. For forty years, she wouldn't talk about it because she didn't want mm -hmm. to relive that pain. Number one but also the humiliation, again, of having that pain. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm reminded also like of just, you know, I'm thinking about in uh, Native American culture, seven generations back, seven generations forward. Right. And, and, and the, you know, carrying the historical, tra the historical trauma, right? So it's not just the, the immediate, the immediate generation that carries the trauma. It's, it's, it's the subsequent um, and, it's, and it's cellular. I mean, we talked about that kind of womb experience a, a little earlier um, and, and that that's why the breaking of these silences is so, so, so like crucial um, because there are, uh, Janice, you talked about the particular, the particular lies that um, that that American culture uh, demands of 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 many to hold and to keep, like keep those you know keep those lies deeply deeply intact. Do not let them out. And then I'm reminded of Audre Lorde's idea. You know, yeah. her claiming your silence will not protect you, exactly. and that. You know, that's where, you know, so that's where, um, you know, the speaking out, the breaking of the silence, the, the processes of valuing our different voices and the deep listening. I mean, I would, I would, or I would say that it is my responsibility to deeply listen, mm. deeply listen. Yeah. And and then that's and that that's where the dialogue can begin. Only if only if someone is deeply listening. Yes. So, um, and in that regard, I would I would love to ask each of you: Would you read another poem for us? And I won't necessarily ask you to go in the same order. I'll let you go as you feel moved called to read. So whoever would like to go first. Can I ask a quick question, Sandra? Yeah. Uh, how much time do we have? Because it might depend on what choices 
Yeah, we've got about, we've got, I would say we have got about 20, 25 minutes we can go. Okay, so it's a possibility to be able to do two poems. Sure, go ahead. Okay. Um, I, I don't need to go first. Mary or Tanya, if you want to go, please. <laughs> <laughs> We're acting like Asian women. <laughs> Uh, we were talking about, um, you were talking about lies that we're supposed to keep intact. And I think all of us in this culture are asked to keep intact the lie of white supremacy. Mm -hmm. And I grew up with blatant white supremacists, but it's really ubiquitous in the whole society. And I wrote a poem about that called Flat Earth White People. Mm. Mom used a lot of bleach when she washed her sheets. They came out really, really white. <laughs> Salt is white. Before the dogs get to it, snow is white. Clouds are sometimes gray, but the big puffy ones are always white. I used to lie on the ground so still, I thought I could feel the earth slowly turning under them. Mom's parents used to sew those sheets into robes and pointed hats because they thought they themselves were white, thought God was white, even told me I was half white. They learned this from their ancestors who never ventured this way until the earth had finally become round for several centuries. Guess they never got real still under the clouds or in front of the mirror. Mm. Okay. Um, I go next. It's just hard to know what to read, right? So, but I think since I was talking about um, I was came, I came from Korea, so I I'm gonna read like Seoksudong, the town there where I came from. Sok, Su, Dong. Sok means rock. Su means water, and Dong means town. Water comes down from the mountain where temples hide in the forest. Gray. Gown monks chant ghost secrets. Tap moktak at dawn. Kun Sunim, big monk, shaved her head, hid her breast in ropes and had a son. She rent out rooms in the temple, put meat in her dumplings, even pork. But everybody bow hapjang as she passed. Near mountain temples, statues of men and women offer their geniles and childless couples. People come to the bow, touch sangi, and wait for life to grow. And just following, just one more poem, short one. A blonde whispers Korean in my ear. We're drinking homemade wine at a child's birthday party. When a blonde mom told me, once I had a Korean boyfriend, his mother hated me, but how I loved her food. Bulgogi, japchae, and you know, you can kiss after you eat that. What is called the smelly cabbage made with a salt baby shrimp, anchovy, garlic and chili. She giggled. I know bad Korean word, she said. Whisper in my ear, I said. I'm not gonna say it. Her face bloomed red as bongsunga. My face was a frozen trout. Onyo Hor used that word. Never wives, not even to their husbands. Never moms not in front of the children. When referring to the um, Korean doctors say changi, a Chinese word, even after Koreans invented. 
That's not a bad word, I replied. It's just a part of the body. Who does she think she is to say that word? When I've never pronounced it with my mouth. So that this poem is like um, publishing the rattle, spring 2018 for a tribute to immigrant poets. So I'm gonna just read a little bit of my note on there. As an immigrant of the Korean diaspora, I know what it feels like being invisible, voiceless and powerless. Writing poem has been a long progress. Even allowing myself to write certain words felt like an impossible transgression. At this time, I was sick at heart, in pain and angry, but something magical was happening. I was able to expose my own wounds through new symbols and images. That's how I write poems. And then I couldn't say two words because it's a tough word to say. So you could Google rattle and then you could find that poem. And then I did it in recording. <laughs> Thank you. I read that poem. <laughs> you did? <laughs> so I didn't, I didn't say two words in there. So you better go find it. <laughs> Treasure yeah. hunt. <laughs> yeah. To get the book. <laughs> I just want to read a fairly brief poem um, called Yes, We Are Not Invisible. Uh, you know, the ongoing image of Asian American Pacific Island communities as a model minority has done so much damage to dehumanize us and pit us against our African, Latinx, Native American brothers and sisters. But since the revolution of the 60s and recovery programs that you know we started at Glide, discovering our authentic selves and voice, poetry has also become weapons for me of defiance and affirmation that challenge negative stereotypes and the diminution, dim, diminution of us. This is called, Yes, We Are Not Invisible. No, I'm not from Tokyo, Singapore or Saigon. No, your dogs are safe with me. No, I don't invade the parks for squirrel meat. No, my peripheral vision is fine. No, I'm very bad at math. No, I do not answer to Geisha Girl, China Doll, Susie Wong, Mama San, or Gook, Jap, or Chink. No, to us, life is not cheap. I do not know the art of tea. And no, I'm not grateful for all you've done for me. Friends of mine have died from AIDS, another driven mad by PTSD. Some of us were murdered, blamed for this economy. Another has OD'd. We've been jailed for mistaken identity, incarcerated because of ancestry. And no, I am not the model minority. No. I am from Stockton, Angel Island, Detroit, Waikiki, San Francisco, Tule Lake, Delano, Chicago, New York City, Anchorage, Phoenix, Raleigh. And yes, I'm alive because of memory, ancestors who endured adversity, the strength of this diversity. No, we are not invisible. And yes, I am from Tokyo, Sing Singapore, Manila, Guam, Beijing, Cambodia, Thailand, Vietnam, India, Korea, Samoa, Hong Kong, Taiwan. Yes, this strength, like ropes of the sun, again lifts a new morning. And yes, we rise as always amidst you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, all three of you, for those just uh, just illuminating poems. I'm really struck in this moment after hearing more poems that you know there's a reason that each of your poets that you go to the image that you go to the word like like Mary choosing that 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 litany to draw attention to white in that poem that, you know, Tanya, when you go to river and, and talk about river and um, 
And also Jim is talking about, I'm alive because of memory. And that idea of, you know, your sensibility as poets, and I think you've each alluded to this, but I'd, I'd like to just hear a little bit more about, you know, what is it that poetry can teach us that history has seemed to elude? Like, we, you know, like we've got history, you know, we've got histories, but what is it that poetry brings that we can't get from history? can't get from the histories, you know, whether it's the lies of the histories or the truth of the histories, I feel like there's something that poetry brings that's different. I feel very strongly that what poetry does is it opens the heart. Mm. That it talks about our, it talks about our full humanity. And what it does is it makes that connection between what is common from all, for all of us. Pain is common for all of us. We all understand what rejection is. We all know that we need love. I mean, some of us have never had love or experienced love until some one person or one community can say, I embrace you, I love you, I accept you. Poetry brings that dimension, a full dimension of selfhood to, I think the experience, whereas history is really quite much more one dimensional. And, you know, any, anybody can tell you facts about the law, about history, about culture, about, you know, food, about any topic. But until you get that experience of, oh, yeah, I didn't realize my mother had such a big appetite after she made tiles and tiles of sushi, right? I mean, that just gives you such an image of your mother yeah. and when you talk about oh you know this blonde woman to whispering this un unnameable name a <laughs> word <laughs> in your ear i mean it just brings alive how insensitive uh, people are to one another about language and about your own soul so i think that that's what poetry does it brings the soul to humanity wow that's what I was exactly wanted to say. The poetry is hard. And then um, I don't know if I could show, I just wrote in Chinese. That's the um, shim. Shim is like, I don't know if you could see that. That's a Chinese shim, it's the mound. And then actually, if you look at it, it it's this word is like a heart. The, I mean, the person. And then, so um, in Korean, it's a maum, ma um is heart. And then that is um, what I think, Janice, you talked to first. <laughs> it was like human to human. Like, I think our heart opens. But um, so even though I did like a portrait reading, Let's say you don't understand Korean, but if I read in just Korean, somehow you're not getting everything. But usually when I do that, like I'm gonna read Korean and then just say what you think you feel what I'm reading. And then they guess like so many different um, things, but when they just get something like because it's a connection tone of the voice the yeah yeah so i think that's i'm totally agree it is the poetry is connection with the humanity connection soul and heart to heart that's what i'm thinking too that is just totally different than we're giving facts of the history this is what happened but during what happened what is really going through in our heart I think that is the poetry gives you life. Yeah. I, yeah, the only thing I can add is that I think history, uh, when it's told by the victor, mm -hmm. by the oppressor, it has an agenda. Poetry never has an agenda. And the other thing is that, um, 
Good point. Is that one of the things that I said in my application for Poet Laureate when they said I was nominated and I had to fill out all these papers. And I, one of the things I had to do was say, what is the importance of poetry? And I don't have the, the statement right in front of me, but in essence, it was that poetry is like the root of an aspen grove. It's what it, underneath all of it, it what, it's what connects us all, you know, all of us, all of humanity. And, and I think you said it really well, both of you, uh, that it's the heart. And mm -hmm. I, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer that we never change anyone's mind. We only change people's hearts, wow. we reach their hearts. Because you, you, know, you think about somebody who is gonna get into a bad relationship with someone who's an addict or they're abusive and you know this, and you say, oh my God, don't, don't, don't. Do they listen? No, they continue because that's where their heart leads them. And so, if people's heart is moved, if, if, if you reach their heart, they will come up with all the reasons why they feel the way they do. They will rationalize, they will look for reasons. You don't have to give them reasons. You never reach people with logic, I don't think. I think we reach people with poetry. That's why it's so powerful. That's why so many autocrats, the first people they kill are the poets, you know, because we can actually affect people's behavior by and change their minds by changing their hearts mm -hmm. and, and so I hope we reached your heart today I mean I hope so because you know you won't think about Asians the same you know you won't think we're all just the same we're just all these can't tell us apart <laughs> so Well, I know you're unique, Mary, and I know you're unique, Tanya. <laughs> I appreciate so much um, being with you and with you, Sandra. Thank you for the, for hosting this. And you know, I think you've opened doors for me. So, God bless. Thank you. And uh, I would just want to, as a you know, as a final closing before I make some just closing remarks. Um, I just want to invite, if you care to, each of you to just, you know, uh, you know, share a final thought or, or something to each other. And um, yeah, or if you want to close with a final poem, I, I just want to hold that space for you. Okay. Mm. You ask some Asian women. <laughs> I want to be polite after you. <laughs> no polite. Um, okay, I think I'm just gonna um, just like one last poem. Um, just like it's it's like just the question that like Oma is like mom, mom. How did you come to America? My 14-year-old daughter asked, the textbook answer or the truth? For better education, better opportunities, and better life, I say. Oma, it's so boring. All Asians in my class have the same answers. <laughs> and um, the part, yes, we want to run away from the truth. We want to forget not remember. We want to protect, not to cause problems. We learn to pretend, delete names, disconnect. I didn't want to look back. My mother's open eyes in her closed casket. But I have to write this story for me. Just the last thing is that um, um, I, I couldn't really tell the whole story, but um, my mom has to sacrifice her life to send us to the United States. And before we united, she had a heart attack and then um, died. And my aunt said uh, her eyes are 
open, she couldn't close. Mm. So to to that um, the line that um, my mother's open eyes in her closed casket that took me about maybe years to write that line. I want yeah. to share with you. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Mm. I I just you know want to salute the courage of. Tanya for, you know, kind of transcending her cultural barriers to be able to tell us this truth that's so close to her. Um, I, I just think that's, that's a, a beautiful gift that she has that, you know, to give us and gave us and thank you so much, Tanya. And Janice, your wisdom, oh my God, I'm just, I'm in awe and, uh, uh, you will always be uh, a powerful person in my life. And thank you so much. And, you know, thank you, Tanya, for, and Kim and Don for making this venue available. And I hope that, you know, it, many, many people hear our stories now and, and um, have a, a new, broader understanding and deeper understanding of the Asian American experience. I really appreciate this opportunity. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Mary, for bringing us together, actually, mm -hmm. and introducing us to Sandra and to this beautiful audience and group of allies that have joined us and hopefully will spread the word. Mm -hmm. Indeed. That's I I uh, there's really not much that I can say better than the three of you have expressed and shared today about you know how we each have you know a, a, a responsibility to see hear love and be in community with each other and re respect um, you know respect honestly our differences and celebrate those differences uh but but hear the full stories of where of how those differences come to come to bear and also come to bring us together uh and how we can move forward um and learn from each other well i i really I am so grateful to the three of you uh, for the opportunity for, for me to hold, even just hold a space for uh, the profound poetry, but, and also the conversation. Um, your, your dialogues with, with us as audience members and also with each other in, in an inter-dialogue, it's been quite a thing to witness and experience. And I'm most, most grateful for your presence, your power, your passion, uh, and of course, your poetry. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sean, for having us. Well, Folks, I want to close today, as I said, finally, again, thanking Janice, Mary Kitani, Mary Owishi, and Tanya Kohong. Please, um, let's unmute briefly to, ex to honor and appreciate how they've shared their cultures, their heritages, their histories, as well as their distinct individual lives and experiences um, and their persistence uh, uh, through the generations, through their mother tongues with us today. If you'd all unmute and uh, share your gratitude. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful. Changed our lives, opened our hearts. Wow. That's the work of poetry, isn't it? <laughs> that is the work of poetry. Well, um, 
I have to do the mundane now after that, which is to share with you that our work continues on. Actually, it's not the mundane. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's how we continue to move the work um, and, and carry it forward from week to week. Uh, May continues here on Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. Next Sunday, we're back um, with our new book showcase in the poet, uh, the poetry of the Fab Four of Risa Denenberg, Kelly Russell Agadin, Diane Zeus, and Mancho Alvarado on location from the banks of the Hood Canal uh, up north here in Washington State. Going to take it on the road. And on May 30th, we have more watery work as we are bringing you Salmon Poetry 40 at 40, a 40th anniversary celebration of the International Poetry Press with special guest host, founder of Salmon Poetry, Jesse Lendeni. And on June 6th, um, please join us back for our next live open mic, your opportunity to share poetry with us on our poets focus on the Anthropocene. So bring your poetry that uh, is connecting with the earth and the serious issues connected with climate change and climate justice. Well, all of our readings are curated with that heart that these three astounding women expressed and uh, generated and modeled for us today with the love of poetry and the love of poets who create them. So as always, feel free to post your events and your readings and your happenings on our pages, our Cultivating Voice Live poetry group page. And we certainly encourage you to share our events page for our upcoming readings where folks can register to join us live in Zoom with your poetry communities. That's, that's how we do spread, spread um, the wealth of love and humanity is by sharing with our communities. Thank you so much for joining me today. And as always, thanks to Don Krieger and Kim Ports Parsons for your dedication to our poetry collaborations. I'm Sandy Anone, your host of Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. I send you all much, much peace and wellness from wherever you are joining us today. Until next time, my friends, hearts, big hearts, safe travels, keep writing.